On behalf of the Zurich Center of Neuroscience, I would like to welcome His Holiness to this Neuroscience Symposium. I would also like, of course, to welcome the gentlewomen and gentlemen of the press, the audience live in this hall, and the audiences who are receiving the video cast and also the webcast. Clearly, this meeting of His Holiness with neuroscientists has generated an enormous interest. The campus up here is absolutely packed with people and everybody is very interested to hear what His Holiness is going to say. And so the first question one might ask is why is His Holiness interested in the brain? And I asked him this a few moments ago and the answer is very simple, it's the most important thing. There's a theory that the landscape of the mind is shaped by the physical landscape that you, in which you are raised. When you walk in the Tibetan landscape, although your feet are on the earth, you feel as if you were walking in the sky. And so it's not surprising to find that Tibetans have open hearts. And as we discover from His Holiness, open minds as well. The broader question, of course, is what has Tibetan Buddhism to do with neuroscience? And the answer is many things. One specific example, cognitive behavioral therapy, perhaps the most scientifically based of therapies, has very close connections to Buddhist meditation practices. But perhaps most immediately, the visit of His Holiness reminds us of the ethical and moral dimensions of our work as scientists. Scientists have discovered that physics has existed everywhere in the universe from the moment that the universe began. Biology has existed in only one place in the universe, here, and has existed for a very short time. That we can think about the origin of the universe, life on Earth, and discover things about ourselves and our place in the universe is, of course, the consequence of having a human brain. The brain that we have is a gift given to us by our ancestors about 100,000 years ago. And the uniqueness of biology and the opportunity that our brain gives us is enormous. But with it comes strong moral responsibilities, not the least to ensure the future of biology. Tibetan monks are very well versed in the art of debate, and I don't think we should try and debate with His Holiness. Much better is to have an exchange of ideas, and I hope in these two hours we'll have as much exchange as possible. There's much common ground. For example, you might know that His Holiness is very interested in clocks and watches. So Switzerland is the right place. But the curiosity of neuroscientists is very similar. We also want to know what makes us tick. How does this complex instrument of the brain work? How can we repair it when it goes wrong? And perhaps, how can we build a brain? Now, as we know from one of Zurich's more eminent graduates, time is relative. But since we're all moving at the same velocity in this room, we only have two hours to reflect on the brain. In Zurich, we have one of the largest concentrations of neuroscientists in Europe. And the panel of experts, who I will introduce briefly later because their curriculum vitae are in this panel, um, I'll introduce as they come to speak. But the first speaker needs no introduction. And His Holiness has kindly agreed to give us an opening consideration of the brain and Buddhism. And 
Tunanang and Gucci was the page. Thank you, Samalia. And you got to the list. Good morning, Shindich. First of all, I would like to say good morning to all of you, the distinguished speakers and uh, organizers of this event, and particularly to all of you who have come here with such interest. <coughs> Of course, indeed, uh, I feel great honor uh, have this meeting with scientists uh, in front of, I think, a large number of audience. <coughs> uh, the, of course, as the introduction he mentioned, me personally, since my childhood, I have always some kind of curiosity, uh, all sort of different uh, phenomena, how it functions, how it goes, uh, particularly the small mechanic things like that. Uh, so then eventually they uh, develop uh, interest about science. Uh, then also, I think the basic Buddhist uh, way of thinking is, firstly, we should know the reality. Then on the basis of that reality, how much can change? Of course, aim is in order to achieve uh, more deeper satisfaction or permanent happiness. Uh, but how to do that, not through just prayer, just wish, or just a recitation of mantra, but, but you have to uh, transform our emotion. Uh, how? Again, uh, uh, the, among the emotion, like I think external thing, the two opposite forces, contradictory forces, by nature there. So that's the basis to transform. If there is no opposition forces there, then no possibility to transform or to change. So that's, I think, uh, nature law. So similarly, in our mind, uh, emotion, there are different forces. Some are direct opposite each other. So then, uh, that's, that's Buddhist sort of way of the uh, system, Buddhist practice. <clears throat> so basically, uh, uh, it is very important to know the reality. Now science, a different method, but the aim is try to know the reality. Uh, then again, Buddhism in general, particularly in the Mahayana Buddhism, the uh, ultimate sort of what's the decision must come on the basis of experiment, uh, not by relying on words, including Buddha's own word. So therefore, we have some kind of liberty uh, to put question about even Buddha's own statement. So this means see, there's so much emphasis the experiment or investigation. So that also the way quite similar. Your mind should be very open. In some cases, need skeptical attitude because skeptical attitude brings question. Question brings effort to, in to investigation. Through investigation, eventually you may get uh, satisfactory answer. So, so, actually, I think now more than, I think 20 years ago, I think 20, 30, almost 30 years ago, the one, one American Buddhist uh, told me, uh, warned me, uh, you should be careful uh, contact with science, scientists because science is killer of religion. 
<laughs> that that expression, you see, actually, I think they helped me more. Oh, what's the killer? <laughs> uh, so actually, as I mentioned br briefly before, said the basic Buddhist way of thinking is they try to know the reality, and that also not relying on word or literature, but rather experiment or reason or investigation. So uh, eventually, I developed. Uh, at the in, initial stage, my personal sort of curiosity, in, personal interest. Then I think more than now, I think 15, 16 years passed. Uh, several occasions meeting with scientists. Um, up to now, mainly in four fields. Cosmology, uh, neurobiology, uh, sub, so the atomic physics, like quantum particle, particle physics, like quantum physics, then psychology. These four fields, these common fields, but this also, is they try to explain these things. Uh, so, so far, according to my experience, it seems uh, in the physical field, I think modern science I think much, much advanced. So therefore, to us, it is very useful to learn where? Uh, from the scientific sort of finding. Then internal matter, like emotion or mind, I think the Buddhist sort of experience, uh, quite, uh, quite advanced. So to this modern scientist, uh, could be useful, useful to, uh, to, to, to learn from the Buddhist explanation. And at least this Buddhist explanation gives them new way to look their subject. So therefore, it is something uh, mutual beneficial. Uh, so therefore, now since now almost four years, now we already, we already started the study of science uh, to selected monk student in monastery. In monastery. Uh, so now, last four years, now progress quite satisfactory. At the beginning, some of our old uh, the scholars, a little bit, uh, at the beginning, a little bit reservation about study of science. <laughs> uh, nowadays, uh, these respected old scholars, they also now begin to realize it is very important, very useful. So now, something like the institutionalized study. Um, <clears throat> so there is, uh, one could say, almost an acceptance, institutional acceptance of science. <clears throat> then I think I, I would like to mention, you see, uh, another uh, few words. Uh, usually, I uh, divided or, or three aspects in Buddhism. First, Buddhist science. As I mentioned earlier, we try to the reality. So they, they are uh, not as a religion, not as a philosophy, but science. Investigate. So one portion, Buddhist science. Second portion, on the basis of this reality, then concept, or oh, there is possibility to change. So that is the Buddhist philosophy. Then third, because of the re reality and the possibility, then practice. So three parts. So when we say dialogue between science and uh, Buddhism, not the other two. Uh, here is an, uh, nothing to do with about nirvana, or about the next life, or these things. <laughs> but but we, are, uh, uh, we are interested, or we are uh, uh, engaging, dialogue. engaging dialogue in the field of Buddhist science. So external science, science of external matters, science of uh, internal, or in other words, the semi 
So within the science, from the Buddhist point of view, we could distinguish between the science of matter and the science of subjective experience. So, so that's about my remark. The, so the, why the science and Buddhism uh, eating something, uh, something interesting. So that's all. Thank you. So we're going to uh, proceed with a, a short panel discussion um, before the next speaker. And uh, I was um, thinking to ask the question, how long have you been interested in the brain for His Holiness? And I thought to ask the 14 three incarnation this question was a, 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 might be a difficult one. But I'm glad to know it's only 16 years. So the, one of the questions is, um, you say this from the uh, side of Buddhism, um, obviously a very well-developed cosmology. Um, is the Buddhist physiology, if you like, um, of brain and anatomy and so on, also as well-developed as the cosmology? Um, although there is no uh, specific discussion of the role of brain itself in the Buddhist uh, understanding, but there is a, a quite a complex understanding and explanation of the human physiology. One interruption. Is that picture which um, time Actually, the, the slide is back to front. <laughs> Forget that the pig do suit you with the According to this slide, you will have to read right from um, right to left. <laughs> Usually we like this. <laughs> that seems simple. <laughs> so we'll, we'll continue. Then then you are the ten way. Now you know all the Jungga Kesha. Um, so uh, a key uh, part of the Buddhist understanding of the physiology and its role um, we are talking about a specific aspect of the Buddhist tradition known as Vajrayana. In this, uh, uh, one of the key ideas within the understanding of human physiology and the role it plays in the uh, human experience, subjective experience and so on, uh, is the idea of uh, what it calls the five internal elements, uh, subtle elements, within which uh, one of the key factors is uh, uh, what we call the air or, or, or wind. And um, the or maybe energy, uh, kind of an energy, yeah. and its primary role is seen as uh, the, that which propels or that which kind of you know uh, um, acts as a medium for cognitive activity. And within the human body, uh, the central location of that energy is thought to be in the crown, in, in the head. So in that sense, there was some recognition of the regulatory role uh, that the, at least the human, part of the human head plays. Okay. So how, how does 
this theory of the five elements then translate into the treatment of diseases that you can experience by just uh, watching people? Again, within the Tibetan tradition, we have a separate medical uh, field, uh, discipline. And in the medical discipline, again, there is a theory of the human uh, anatomy and physiology, and also the, the channels uh, of these uh, nerves. But His Holiness was saying that he is quite ignorant <laughs> of the medical theory. I know uh, how to eat Tibetan medicine, <laughs> but I don't know. That whole s medical system, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but now here, yeah, you see, the, uh, I, think, I think in the Buddhist science, as I mentioned earlier, you see, the, when explain about body and then the relation between mind or emotion and body. Uh, now the explanation uh, why mind moving, then these elements now uh, involve. Uh, so the, I think, main purpose explanation in Tantrayana, in Bandrayana, is uh, how to neutral, neutralize uh, these uh, uh, negative emotion uh, through one special method or unique method is to subsidize uh, shukshuntam. On the grosser level mind, the shukshuntam, dhitane, any kasurpage, nyumu, yodraya. Um, one of the key interests in the Vajrayana um, practice or Vajrayana tradition is uh, finding a way or a method by which we can learn how to minimize the destructive nature of the, the afflictive emotions. And um, one of the ways in which it does it is to try to bring the level of conscious experience to a subtler state. So the key idea is how to understand uh, the relationship between the physiological processes and the kind of e emotions that tend to afflict us, uh, how they relate to each other. So there are many, uh, I'll say the different level of consciousness as well as these elements. There are some subtle, some gross or gross or gross or like that. So we'll uh, proceed to the uh, talk of uh, Professor Jörg Kesselring, um, who is the head of the Department of Neurology at the Rehabilitation Center in Valence. And um, he's going to be talking to us about neurobiology and spirituality. Your Holiness, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, I thank you for the opportunity to explore as a practicing physician and neurologist the relationship between neurobiology and spirituality and on whether I see them as controversy or as complement. In a debate in Oxford, friends of Charles Darwin, the author of Origin of Species, were confronted with representatives of the church. Darwin, of course, had come <coughs> through observations and many years of careful studies to the conviction that organisms have developed by adaptation to the constraints and pressures of changes in the environment, a process for which the term natural selection was coined. For the representatives of the faith, it was unbearable that man who in their tradition was a fallen angel in need of redemption should be seen only as an animal struggling for survival. 
From the modern biological point of view, there is no doubt that evolutionary processes have led to the formation of body structures and functions as we study them in medicine. Genetics over the years have contributed greatly and have provided insight into the mechanisms of natural selection and the way by which information is transmitted from one generation to the next. In clinical practice, I am confronted with a patient who is a person with his or her individual history and who is at the same time a biological entity with a long history of development. In this situation, we cannot restrict our view on the purely biological aspects. We have learned and see it each day that the organism is not just fixed and determined in its behavior but mutable according to requirements from the environment. This epigenetic aspect of development and behavior is activity dependent. We know that the remodeling of neural networks in our brains is a lifelong opportunity and that from the many new connections which are formed spontaneously and continuously, only those remain stable which are used. This is the basis of learning. Concerning the brain, the saying is correct, use it or lose it. But who is the one who uses or loses his or her brain? There are three ways of learning. First of all, genetics. Male, female, child, there is not much we can do about, although it is important to understand the genetic makeup of a person. We just should not see genetics as so simple as we do when saying that because of our sharing of more than 95% of the genetic code with other organisms, we are quasi the same. All our books are written in the same code, the alphabet, but the arrangement of it by an author makes all the difference and this arrangement is an activity dependent epigenetic phenomenon which leads us to asking about the author. Second, we learn by imitation and association. <laughs> the description of mirror neurons is arguably the most important discovery, I think, in recent years because they provide the basis of this way of learning which is so characteristic of us human beings and which explains our capacity to transmit acquired knowledge and acquired skills to future generations in addition to genetic information. This is the basis of cultural tradition which we cannot see to the same degree in the animal kingdom. Third, we learn by doing, by practicing and rehearsing. This again points to the importance of activity-dependent development. We see this every day in the practice of neurorehabilitation of patients with diseases of the nervous system. For instance, this gentleman has had a stroke two years previously and had as a hobby uh, painting. And he was not able to hold the brush in his right hand because of the stroke. And that is the first picture he drew with his left hand. And so we have to ask ourselves, what happened in this brain during recovery <coughs> uh, that it made possible to find another outlet from their brain to produce or to perform such a wonderful picture. The scientists, such as they are here, tell us that the brain can be reorganized according to the requirements from the environment. And the paths these patients follow in their recovery are similar to the one we observe during the development of behavior in the normal child. The human child needs a much longer period of development than all its fellow beings in the animal world, a period in which it is more and for a much longer time protected from the struggle of life. During this period, the child learns not only to adapt to the chances and challenges of the environment, but rather to adapt and shape the environment according to its needs. And from spiritual teachings we know, or we should know, that if, however, we try to shape our environment or to influence our fellow be beings only according to our short-term wishes, we, feel <coughs> uh, we will inevitably fail in the long run. 
From these teachings, we feel the urge not only to study the individuum per se, but rather how it stands and behaves in its social surroundings. And there, the fittest to survive is the one who takes care about his fellow beings. From a list of factors which are important in human development, I pick out only two, which illustrate, I think, best the way by which the human brain developed to prepare the ground for what in spiritual language may be called incarnation. First, this upright gate is clear <coughs> that the new requirements of balance against the forces of gravity necessitate a reorganization of a brain in order to uh, walk upright, or at least it was uh, the plan during some stage of development. <laughs> then the second point is the freeing of the hands and using of tools. Of course we know that even in the animal kingdom tools are used but clearly to a much lesser degree and never has an animal been observed to use a tool in order to make tools with it and we are doing that all the time. And some minute biomechanical requirements were important for using tools uh, adequately. For instance, in monkeys are not able to oppose the thumb, and even our predecessor Lucy was not able to do that, but we can. And another important mechanical adaptation of the hand was the deviation towards the ulnar side. It's obvious that when using a tool or a weapon, we are much more in advantage uh, in the struggle of life if we can prolong <coughs> our, our arm almost into the uh, infinity. It's clearly to be seen that this simple mechanical adaptation which does not take place in the animal kingdom has led to a great advantage in the survival. But of course, I'm convinced that it is not uh, it was not intended purely for uh, the battles, but rather here we see the final goal of human development in playing a cello. <laughs> and the tools themselves that were used over the millions of years follow in shape from the original cosmic sphere, like to the point of a pen, a gesture, that can be seen as if they were preparing the ground for the, what spiritual teaching calls, incarnation of an individual into a body. This continuous interaction between the organism and the environment via the use of tools has led to the development of the human brain and very differently from all other animals to the formation of the frontal lobes. These frontal lobes appear in function like the composer and the conductor in an orchestra, in which many players exert their skills following a plan or score which they have not written themselves. So we should not mistake our brain for ourselves. It would be in philosophical terms a categorical mistake. And if we see our frontal lobes and their functions as basis of spiritual or even divine life, we are in very good company. I have no doubt that Michelangelo in this picture has the secret of a brain incorporated into the mantle of God. We see the, the frontal lobes here, cerebellum back here, brainstem, temporal lobe, and his probably not just by chance, pointing across the frontal lobe into the universe for the creation. We may learn to follow the process of what is called incarnation as illustrated in these examples. As we may even apply it successfully to the treatment of neurological patients. Too often, however, we have much more difficulties in understanding and caring for the other process which follows inevitably, and that is excarnation or dying. And it may be the fear of the unknown which often leads to hectic undertakings at the end of life. But in these situations especially, we should learn from those who know more about spirituality 
when the appropriate activity is to let go in dignity. Charles Darwin himself, at the end of his life, made an allusion that he had missed a bit of spiritual teaching during his life, although he had a most successful neurobiological career, we can say, and he writes in his autobiography that if he had to live his life again, he would have made a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once a week, and he hopes that perhaps the parts of his brain that he considers atrophied now could have been kept active through use. Thank you very much. Um, His Holiness was very interested in your explanation of how the process of recovery of, say, um, a physical faculty in in the in the aftermath of a stroke uh, seems to mirror, to some extent, um, the development and men- mental process of a child and so on. And uh, with this respect, uh, one thing that he would like to ask uh, is, um, within you mentioned how if certain part of the brain is damaged, in some sense the role is taken over, the brain learns to reorganize itself so that another part of the brain takes over to perform the function. So he was wondering within this, um, and this is of course related to how uh, our um, brain and body adapt also to the environment. So he was wondering whether there's a way of finding out what part of that recovery process is simply a natural process, or will any deliberate Purely intention... On, on no. physical level. No. Without or conscious no, right, intention. Uh, intention. So he was wondering Another, whether, mm-hmm. whether a deliberate intention on the part of the patient will make a difference in the process of recovery. And similarly, with this relation, um, we know that our human body adapts to the environment, and due to environmental factors, you have different types of human physical appearances. In some part of the world, you have beings with more hair and so on. All of these physio, you know, physical characteristics are totally unintentional. There is no conscious you know, element involved in it. It's simply a body's way of adapting to the environment. But there might also be uh, uh, changes where an intention could have played a part because due to the interaction of uh, the body and the environment, a new changes occur and then human beings learn new insights and then utilize that insight and to adapt further. So he was wondering whether there is an understanding of these kind of things. <laughs> For example, in the example that you gave of the artist who suffered a stroke and learned to paint with his left hand, there in that example you can see there's a real deliberate intention. There are, of course, developments which just naturally occur. That's what I wanted to show with the picture of the genetics, where there is a man and a woman and a child. <clears throat> there we cannot do much about. But then there is the teaching. And uh, 
what we learn in school depends very much on the interaction and on the intention of our wanting to learn and about the te uh, depends on the teaching of the teacher. And similar adaptations are possible in rehabilitation and I hope that we can shape an environment for the patient so that it is the best situation for him to learn. And learning is this new wiring of the brain. And it's just the best analogy we find for the on the physical ground that a patient after a stroke or an injury to the brain, when he is recovering, he goes through similar processes that the normal child goes during normal development. And it's just the best analogy we can come to, so we try to form the environment for this individual in a way that he can go at, uh, through a process which in the child has led to success because we all are behaving normally. Not so special, but that's the norm. And we can ask ourselves, in what conditions did our brain develop in order to make this normality possible? But if I may just ask a question, uh, <coughs> when I made this uh, allusion to incarnation, and I can understand this sort of teaching. And when we are talking about excarnation, that's leaving of an individual from the body, just to ask a master, is there a possibility to get into contact with an individual during incarnations, if you are talking about reincarnations, which I cannot really understand myself? But just as a question, into contact. to get into contact, whether I cannot understand that it is possible to get into contact with somebody who is not in a body. Um, of course, um, I mean, this, this question of incarnation is not really part of the Buddhist science, so there's no, no direct relevance to uh, to uh, uh, dialogue with science, but yes, traditionally speaking, there is an understanding. Buddhist science is not related. Buddhist science is not related. Buddhist science is not related. They are not related. They are not related. They are Buddhist science is not related. The modern science is not related. Are you sometimes? Sorry, there is a disagreement here. <laughs> um, I misunderstood. His Holiness was saying that. Uh, the, the, the concept of re rebirth is, in a sense, uh, Oh, now this is really related, <laughs> uh, related with the, uh, the concept of continuation of subtle mind. So that uh, subtle consciousness, that Buddhist, uh, Buddhists consider that as science, it's nature, it's reality. But uh, in modern science, this is not yet because of that. Touch. Yeah. So, so irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe we come back to it. Because you were saying that there is an understanding that some individuals, not all, but some individuals, exceptional individuals, may be able to. Um, the the So, His Holiness was saying that yes, the concept of rebirth, because it is related to the Buddhist understanding of the nature of subtle consciousness and its continuity is in a sense within the domain of what we call, what he calls Buddhist science. But since this remains outside the, the you know, domain of modern science, in some sense it's not really part of the things that he normally discusses in a dialogue. But to respond to your question, traditionally there is an understanding that some individuals may be able to uh, enter into contact with uh, you know, those beings. I think uh, at least the beginning of the 21st century, I think modern science, uh, I think not, uh, not yet developed serious interest about, about this field. 
perhaps the later part of this century or 20, 22nd century, or made, that was that, made develop more interest. The science always has to develop, develop, develop. And also our capacity to investigate also increasing. So therefore, some hidden phenomena then become more clear. More clear. So we're going to um, move on to the next talk, which is given by Professor Lutz Janka, who's a professor of um, neuropsychology at the University of Zurich. Your Holiness, dear colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. One of the most important discoveries in the last 15 years in cognitive neurosciences is the fact that the human brain can be shaped by external influences. Typical external influences are learning and experience. An interesting aspect of human brain plasticity is the fact that the human brain can not only be shaped in terms of function, it also can be shaped in terms of anatomical structure. Thus, the architecture of the human brain can be shaped by experience, which is, in my sense, a very important new finding. A further important finding is that this brain plasticity is not only restricted to early childhood, it also extends into adulthood. And some people believe that this plasticity never ends. Now, sorry for that. In order to study functional plasticity in the human brain, we and others are using professional musicians as a tool. Professional musicians are ideal for studying functional plasticity because mostly they start very early in life with musical training, not seldom at the age of three, four, or five years. And then they continue to practice throughout their entire life, three to eight hours a day. Thus, there must be a strong influence on the brain. And by looking and examining at these subjects, we found a lot of very, very interesting findings. Over here, you can see a short summary on this slide, what we and others have found. You can see a standard brain on which colored areas are indicated. These colored areas are those areas which have been consistently and reliably shown to change their architecture due to musical training. Over here, you can see typical areas which are involved in controlling the hands, areas which are involved in controlling acoustic stimuli, but you can also see areas in the frontal lobe where subjects have to control their overall behavior. A further relatively new aspect is that cognitive practice, and especially musical practice, can have a kind of protective effect of normal or normal aging. On this slide, you see in red color those brain areas indicators which show a reduced loss of gray matter due to musical practice in old age. Thus, if you continue to practice your musical skills, you will have less loss of gray matter in these areas. However, although music is a fascinating and rewarding behavioral aspect to study in the context of cognitive neurosciences, it is necessary to point out that music is not special. Various kinds of cognitions can also have a strong impact on brain, brain plasticity. Thus, the main message evolving from this research is that the brain needs cognition. One simply can summarize this by phrasing, use them, the cognitions, or lose them. You can also say, be attentive and eager. 
to learn throughout your entire life. And I would like to emphasize entire life, just before you die. Your brain will love it. <laughs> Finally, I would like to emphasize another interesting aspect which is related to music perception and music processing. Recently, we and others have learned that music is an ideal tool to induce the so-called default models of brain processing. In this mode, the human brain is rejecting external stimulation and is concentrating solely on internal processes. Meanwhile, we do know the brain structures which are involved in this processing mode. You can see the brain structures over here. This is a typical default mode where the brain is only concentrating on itself and rejecting the external world. And we have indicated the mesial frontal lobe as the main area which is involved in generating this process. Now we think that this relatively new finding is typical or uncovers a typical human cognition which has not been found in a similar way in animals. Maybe we have opened a new door to study human consciousness. What have I presented so far? In this presentation, I have presented some findings demonstrating that music is an ideal tool to induce brain plasticity. But not only music is ideal in inducing brain plasticity, but also other cognitions. If you learn and are eager learning throughout your entire life, your brain will change the entire day. Secondly, I have shown that we are currently learning that there are different kind of brain processing modes in the brain. One is the so-called default mode. This default mode is interesting because it shows that the human brain can concentrate on itself without relying on external information. Thank you very much for your attention. So, in some sense, uh, one of the questions that His Holiness was saying he had felt uh, from your earlier presentation was um, within the, the rate of recovery that is involved uh, when the part of the brain is damaged, um, will there be a difference in the pace of the recovery between human beings and animals? And if so, then of course, deliberate intention will be playing a major role. So given that um, your presentation seems to clearly uh, suggest that the role of deliberate intention, the focused attention, seem to be an important part uh, of the brain. Yeah, indeed, uh, this is a very important aspect. Although we distinguish at least two different kinds of learning processes, one kind of learning processes relies on deliberate attention, while the other learning process mostly rely on kind of implicit learning. Um, for the first part, deliberate attention is very important. Uh. <laughs> Uh, and, and your 
a beautiful suggestion that um, how you know uh, the brain loves learning and that uh, we must con you know how learning is so crucial even for the very survival and the, and the health of the brain this reminds his Holiness was saying him of uh, a saying by a great Tibetan master who says that learning is something that you must do even if you know you're going to die tomorrow <laughs> Stress that a little bit. I think even that the human brain has been evolved to be a kind of learning machine. And I think this is one of the great endeavors of human beings to learn. Given that in science there is a tremendous emphasis is placed on uh, intersubjective verification and also a kind of a, a repeatability of the same phenomenon, uh, same uh, uh, experiments across uh, a commonly shared phenomenon. So if learning uh, is what, you know, which involves a deliberate learning and focused attention that has a, a role in maintaining the, the brain, um, then how can we um, account for, say for example, among politicians, when they are active politicians, and of course they have to think, they have to and calculate. Also, also, I know it's one of my uh, sort of, I can say it's my tutor, my, uh, tutor. My, no, teacher. My, my teacher, a great physicist. Uh, now very old, uh, his mind. And even he admits that he cannot really think clearly now. So we see in some instances where we know that the individuals have learned a lot and learning has been an important part and particularly deliberate thought processes, focused thinking has been an important part. But yet, you know, we see a lot of, they suffer degenerative uh, illnesses. And among Tibetan scholars, uh, generally it's very clear those uh, many years sort of study is their brain usually, even at a very old age, is still remain very clear. True. But some exceptional case, also there are some great scholar, but at the end, go like that. <laughs> so therefore, there must be one third factor. Genetic disposition. So, um, so what would be that third factor? Would that be genetic? Disposition? Yeah, indeed, there are genetic factors, no doubt about that, but there are also other factors which might influence the brain in terms of uh, inducing a kind of, I would say, uh, hazardous aging. But when we look very closely at older people, we can see that those older people who are cognitive intact, even in older ages, mostly do a lot of cognitive things. A recent study has shown that very elegantly especially they, in this study it was shown that um, older subjects who did music in the old ages or playing board games and dancing, all these things, they had less likelihood of generating kind of dementias. So there's a kind of interaction in my sense between genetic influences and uh, cognitive stimulation. Um, so, so I'd like to ask a question too. Um, what, what is very impressive here is Thubten Jimpa and uh, his translation, because he seems to remember very long and complicated. <laughs> and <laughs> So if we put him in the scanner, which parts of the brain do we expect to be bigger? <laughs> it's a question to me. 
It's not a matter of uh, bigger or smaller brains. It's more a matter of connectivity in all the things. So. Just deciding whether he's going to volunteer. <laughs> so um, we're going to look at the third factor now, and that is genetics. And Roger Nietzsche is going to tell us about Alzheimer's disease. Your Holiness, dear students, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Habemus Papam. When the Roman conclave elected Pope Benedict XVI earlier this year, the person, Josef Ratzinger, was 78 years old. At old age, his intellect is brilliant, he speaks fluently many languages, and even gave his inauguration speech in ancient Roman. In these days, we celebrate the 70th birthday of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. We congratulate and we realize that he is a brilliant thinker at 70 years. Jeanne Calment, for a long time, was the oldest woman in Europe. She died in 1997 with 122 years old. She was a fascinating woman uh, in very many ways. And one of the interesting things is that she rarely saw a doctor throughout her life. She was really sick. And this teaches us that without disease, many human subjects can probably reach this old age. Old age is not a major cause of death in humans. We still die mostly of the consequences of disease. But with the steadily improving tools in diagnosis and treatment, modern medicine now is able to prevent many disease-related deaths. And as a consequence, people are fortunate enough to enjoy old life in reasonably good health. The other consequence is that the aged population in our societies uh, increase to record high levels. Now, unfortunately, the privilege of enjoying age in reasonably good health is not shared by all people. About a third people at old age develop dementia, the kind of phenomenon that the Dalai Lama just described. A person who was intellectually brilliant, fantastic teacher throughout his life comes down with dementia at the end. Uh, U.S. President Ronald Reagan, who uh, led the country for a decade, develops Alzheimer's disease. How can we explain that? Now, one of the interesting things in the brain is, besides that it's the most or one of the most complex structures in the universe, is that the cells in the brain, the neurons, are not replaced. So they age with the person who carries them. In contrast, the cells of our skin or of the intestine are replaced by new cells almost every day, but not the cells in the brain. So they accumulate damages over life. And this accumulation of damages is the reason for the fact that aging is the most important risk factor for the development of dementia. Dementia is the medical term for the loss of cognitive functions the abilities to think, to speak and understand, to make memories, thoughts, ideas, to share them with others, to anticipate, to act proactively, and the ability to pass acquired wisdom and knowledge to the next generations. All these functions are lost in Alzheimer's disease, which is the most important form of dementia. It takes away these abilities gradually. It was discovered or described 100 years ago by the German neuropsychiatrist Alois Alzheimer, who discovered together with his colleague Franz Nissel the reason for dementia, the deposition of amyloid plaques in brain. 
The clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease begin in a very subtle way. Most people are still working during that time, are driving cars, are traveling. It's very hard to detect it at the beginning. The patients look normal, they move normally, they are dressed normally. But it starts with subtle changes in short-term memory. The patient will ask a question twice that was just answered, or she will immediately forget what she has just read in the newspaper or in a book. Or after she had made a choice in a restaurant, she would not be able to order it because she forgot it. In another person, Alzheimer's disease can start with changes in spatial orientation. When he drives back to his home, he cannot find the street where he uh, is living for about 30 years. Or he's driving the car on the wrong side of the, uh, of the, of the street, finding himself confused uh, on the highway. As a consequence, the patients are often anxious and embarrassed about the loss of function. They react with emotional sadness to this loss of capability that had been so normal throughout life. As time goes by, more and more signs of disease add on. The loss of practical abilities such as dressing a shirt, tying a shoelace, or using the telephone. Cooking a meal gets increasingly difficult. Now the patients also have difficulties with finding words or speaking and with comprehending the meanings of what they listen to. Many words that had been known throughout their life now are experienced as entirely new words that they never had heard before. Foreign languages that were learned later in life vanish first, but with time also the mother tongue slips away. Ronald Reagan, when he uh, experienced Alzheimer's disease, described it as a gradual decline uh, and as he compared it to the sunset where the sun gradually goes down and leaves him in darkness. At the end of this process, the patients are unable to speak, to recognize even the closest relatives. They are completely dependent on care throughout every day and every night, in many cases for many years, until they die of additional infections of the lung, pneumonia, or other causes. Since the initial description of the disease by Alice Alzheimer, we learned a lot about the causes of the disease, and we now are witnessing the development of the first effective treatments and prevention of the disease. In brain, the abnormal protein beta amyloid accumulates to form beta amyloid plaques and amyloid in the blood vessels. Uh, amyloid is one of the million proteins that is made in our brain, and it is usually made to preserve the function of our nerve cells. We all make this protein all the time in our brains, now as we listen to this lecture, as well as when I'm giving the talk. When the concentration of this amyloid protein is high enough, it starts to aggregate, clump together, and by clumping together, it changes its structure. And with this change of structure, it becomes toxic to the nerve cells and damages the nerve cells. We are now witnessing the development of drugs that are designed to reduce the formation of these abnormal protein aggregates or to prevent them. One of the most exciting developments is the idea of vaccination against beta amyloid. Here, the person vaccinated generates antibodies, some of which migrate into the brain, bind to the amyloid plaques, and help the normal clearance processes of the brain to remove it. And we were fortunate enough and privileged to take part in the first clinical study of this vaccination, and we have seen patients that experience more than three years now of uh, normal function, no, loss, no further loss of decline, despite the fact that they were diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So we have great hopes that the use of such antibodies in the future can help us preserve brain function, prevent the development of dementia, and help the majority of old people 
to enjoy uh, old life in good health. Thank you. Um, just uh, out of curiosity, you uh, described very well the process of uh, degeneration and the loss of memory, you know, culminating even to the point of not recognizing your intimate family members, the loved ones. Um, out of curiosity, Solens was wondering whether uh, at some point do we also lose the ability to read? Yes, you will lose the ability to read, to speak. Yes. Like not being able to even recognize the alphabets. Yes, you will not be able to recognize the alphabet. You will see the alphabet and you will experience it as a new alphabet. That you will see the alphabet and the experience is that it is a novel alphabet that you have never seen before. Um, wondering in the, as memory degenerates, <coughs> uh, does it also will it also have an effect on decreasing of passions and and um, you know anger and hostility and so on? That is a very interesting question. The emotions change during the disease very much. Sometimes patients react with sadness because of the loss of the ability. But then when the disease progresses further, sometimes the sadness is followed by some kind of rudimentary happiness. People enjoy to be close with their loved ones. They enjoy body contacts. And so this can be a later phase of the disease as well. So we see both forms of emotional reaction. And in the late stage, unfortunately, we get very little signs from the patient that tells us about his or her emotions. So we don't know whether in the very late stages the emotions are still preserved or whether the emotional or the capability to have emotions is also gone. It's very difficult to tell because we don't see them anymore. So we're going to um, move to the last talk to give us a bit more space for discussion. There's some questions too that, uh, that some of the students want to ask. And uh, so Rolf Pfeiffer, um, who's the Professor of Artificial Intelligence here at the University of Zurich, um, will be talking about intelligence. Uh, His Holiness, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I come from a background of artificial intelligence where we try to build artifacts, robots, computer programs. And the goal of this uh, short presentation will be to introduce this term of embodiment and uh, show some of its implications. And there are sometimes surprising insights. And a particularly interesting insight, I think, is, is how much can be achieved with how little brain. I mean, we all have heard about the importance of the brain. Everybody knows how important the brain is. I would like to show how much you can achieve with how little brain. This is an idea that we also call cheap design. Now, the classical view of uh, intelligence um, is that intelligence is centralized in the brain and that it can be studied as a computational process. So the slogan is kind of cognition as computation. So the idea that intelligence can be viewed or thinking can be viewed as a computer program or as an algorithm. Now this view has had many successes in the past. So if you turn on your computer 
um, you will be using algorithms, programs, without noticing, that have their origin in this particular uh, perspective or idea. Now, there have also been many failures. For example, this perspective has failed to contribute to our understanding of more natural forms of intelligence, uh, anything to do with perception, manipulation of objects in the real world, or locomotion, walking, running, and crawling. Now, uh, the term embodiment, there is a trivial meaning to it, saying that intelligence requires a body. There has been some discussion about that before. Uh, but there, I think there is a more interesting meaning, a non-trivial meaning, which is to do with the interplay of brain morphology. By morphology, I mean you know, the anatomy, the particular shape, the sensors where you have the eyes, where you have the touch sensors on the fingertips and so on, materials, muscles, tendons, bones, and the environment. Now, I want to give you a few illustrations here. First, about exploiting materials. If you look at traditional robots, uh, they're typically built of hard materials and electrical motors. By contrast, the human muscle tendon system has various degrees of elasticity and stiffness. For example, you know, I have a pen here. If I want to grasp this pen, I will normally grasp it like this, right? But I can also grasp it like this. But I have to expend more effort because this is like winding a spring. So the muscle tendon system has spring-like properties. Now, if I let go my arm in this position, it will automatically turn back into its natural position like this, but without control, just because of the material properties of the muscle tendon system. And this is, of course, very good control because it's completely decentralized. It doesn't require central resources, and it's free. I mean, the material properties are there anyhow, so you might as well exploit them. So f physics, in this sense, is for free. Now, something about exploiting mor uh, morphology and materials. So uh, this is the Yokoi hand, which was developed by Hiroshi Yokoi at the University of Tokyo. And it is taking morphological properties of the human hand uh, into account. For example, you have the hand like this, and if you do this, this movement, your fingers will automatically come together without much control. And this is because of the specific morphological properties of the hand. So here, this is bent, this is not straight, which is why the hands or the fingertips will automatically come together. This is exploited in this particular design. And it also, this is a, a video of, of uh, this hand, and there is only one control which is close. And then there are elastic tendons, so whatever object you put into the hand, the hand will grasp it properly and the fingers will come around the object without control. It's always the same control, but depending on the object, the fingers will do something different. So the details of the, uh, the, details of the uh, let's say, grasping is performed by the morphology and the materials. So this hand can grasp any shape, but it knows nothing about shapes. This is also what we call self-regulation, and it's very easy to control. We can also use this hand as a prosthetic hand, and here you can see it being tested on a patient. Now, this hand is, among others, it's controlled by uh, EMG signals, and you know, so sort of electric, uh, you take that from the surface of the skin, muscle innervation, and these are very poor signals. They have a very poor signal-to-noise ratio, but because the hand takes over a lot of the control itself, it doesn't matter that we don't have a very good signal. Let me give you a few additional examples. This is about passive dynamics. So here is a beautiful robot. So this is a ramp. It's an incline. It's at an angle. And this robot walks down this incline without control. There is no microprocessor on this robot. There is no electrical motor on this robot, but still it walks very beautifully because it has the proper morphology and exploits the dynamics. For example, the passive swing of the leg, the for passive forward swing of the leg. By the way, in, when humans walk, the forward swing of the leg, which you probably haven't noticed, is always passive. You don't need any force. You, don't, you just exploit gravity and the fact that the leg is a pendulum. Now, this approach can be extended. This is a robot developed in Delft that walks on the same principles. It has very, very little actuation. It uses very little energy. 
to walk, and the swing of the legs is also passive. Well, <laughs> not, not quite perfect yet, you know, but uh, I think we're, uh, we're working on it. So this is also, I think, a nice example of exploiting uh, morphological properties of exploiting dynamics. By contrast, if you look at these robots, these are very sophisticated robots. This one here, this one here is developed by Sony Curio, very sophisticated. You can see it's kind of cute, but the way it walks or runs is very unnatural. Too much control. Now, exploiting materials and dynamics. Uh, we have been studying for quite some time now rapid locomotion. It's considered, in robotics, it's considered a very hard problem. And to date, there are no robots that match the speed, for example, of natural... Uh, natural beings. But I think if you think differently about the problem, you can achieve interesting results. For example, well, let's, I, I will show it to you in slow motion. So this is a robot. It has almost, it has all, virtually no brain. All it does, it moves the front and the hind legs like this. And then there is a particular, as you can see here, we have some springs here. And then because of these springs and because of the weight distribution in the robot, if you put it on the ground, it will get into its natural gait. So it's got very simple control. We exploit the spring-like properties of the materials, like the muscles, they also have spring-like properties. And we have this phenomenon that we call self-stabilization. Let me explain that a little further. So we put, again, an example of chief yeah, design. So we put the dog on a treadmill. And then we have a high-speed camera facing at the treadmill. And then I want to show you a slow motion from the high-speed camera. Now watch closely. The movement is very irregular, but the robot will always self-stabilize into a particular gate. There are no sensors on this robot. It's just a mechanical system. So basically the idea is, even if it's irregular, there are disturbances, the robot will get back into its natural gait. So the idea is kind of let nature do its work, don't interfere. So uh, you can also exploit the system environment interaction. That's the last example that I would like to give you. So here is an artificial fish called Wanda. So, so, so. Now, oops. Now the idea is, the idea of this fish is, it's, it has only one degree of freedom of actuation. Also, this means that it can only wiggle its tail fin like this. That's all it can do, nothing else. But still, this robot can move up and down, left, right, can change the speed, can reach any point in 3D space. Now, this seems logically impossible if you can only wiggle your tail fin. Now, I'll show you that it actually works. So here, here's the fish. So it goes down. Now, the buoyancy of this fish is such that if it doesn't do anything, it will move down slowly. Now, turning is easy, of course. You just put the, the zero point of the oscillation, and then it will turn. Now, what also happens if the fish turns is because of the particular weight distribution on the robot, it will tilt a little when it turns. And then because it's tilting, it's moving like this, and then it gets the up thrust, and then it goes, it goes up. And now it's taking a breath of air there. <laughs> Again, uh, this uh, idea of cheap design. Okay, in summary, uh, what I tried to show is that intelligence is not exclusively located in the brain, but there's kind of a task distribution between brain, body, and environment, and this idea of cheap design. The take-home message would be the real world is there, uh, waiting to be exploited. Remember the fish, remember the material properties. Not everything needs to be controlled, this phenomenon of self-stabilization that we had in the hand, and we had it in the robot dog and physics is for free, so you might as well exploit it. This is what Rodney Brooks from MIT called the Zen of robot engineering. Thank you very much for your attention. So um, there are a few students here who um, wanted to ask questions, and I think we would like to start with them. So 
if you could start, come up to the microphone and give your name and ask your question, please. Your Holiness, my name is Sonja Pflau, and my question is, do Tibetan Buddhists understand Do Tibetan Buddhists understand the functioning of the central nervous system as a reflection of the global spiritual development of a human being? Um, can you repeat the question? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do Tibetan Buddhists understand the functioning of the central nervous system as a reflection? of the global spiritual development of a human being. Yigitsum. Um, it's, it's difficult to say, but there is a, a kind of a similar idea in certain um, aspects of the Buddhist thought, uh, particularly in the Vajrayana tradition. For example, there is one particular text uh, which speaks of how um, the sentient world, not just human beings, but also the animal world, um, in some sense represents a kind of a, 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 a microcosm um, of the natural world, and where there's a close correlation made between how um, the sentient world can be represented in the form of uh, letters, the alphabets of the, the consonants of the language, and how each of these consonants can be uh, a sort of a, a cipher or a symbol for um, a various part of the body, particularly the, the energy channels, and how these channels uh, contain the energies, and these in energies can be seen as further manifestations of a deeper uh, level of prana, which is the wind, um, so, and given that the, human, uh, the sentient world, the, um, humans and animals share the same basic physiology, there's an understanding that there is a kind of a correspondence. It, it, there's a kind of a uh, correlation made. And this uh, understanding is based upon uh, an understanding the, the evolution and the dissolution of the natural world, both of the sentient being and the environment that we live in. Uh, so, in, for example, in the Kala Chakra system, 
uh, a specific terminology is used, for example, for the, uh, the internal world of the sentient, the term internal Kala Chakra or Wheel of Time is referred, and the external world of the natural world and the cosmos is referred to as the external Kala Chakra or Wheel. Is it your question? No, <laughs> oh, then okay. Good. Thank you very much. Your Holiness, my name is Martin Chile and I have the following question. Some neuroscientists claim that the conscious mind is only a byproduct of the brain and there is no free will. If this is so, why should we struggle so hard to free our will? If this is so. And then, uh, and a neuroscientist ゲレチャワタ、レベチャシェルチュマスコレス。um, part of the problem here is how do we what do we mean by freedom? The freedom of will. When we say free will, what do we mean by freedom? If the suggestion is that there is a kind of a will that is totally free of um, any law of causation, that that is just arises you know, out of nowhere with no cause, then from the Buddhist point of view, that's not a tenable position. On the other hand, if we are talking about deliberate intention, that we can cultivate a will to do something, then you know, experientially, we all fe experience free will. Do we have further question? This is how we Um, in fact, it became clear from the, the, the little, uh, the, sorry, the, the brief presentations we have had in this meeting itself, how there is a room for uh, human intervention and deliberate intention, and how that kind of willed intention and activity makes a difference. So even within the scientific pre paradigm that we are speaking, we saw a room for will, free will. Your Holiness, my name is Daniela Wies. Uh, so we heard about um, illnesses affecting the brain, about the divers to cure them. So my question is, or I would want to um, hear your view about how we can overcome diseases. The question is, how can we overcome diseases? Although from the Buddhist point of view, um, it's difficult to make any um, kind of specific contribution to the actual 
a, a healing of a disease once the disease has struck, um, which is more of a medical issue. However, uh, in terms of uh, prevention, uh, you know, Buddhist, Buddhism might have something to offer. For example, one thing that becomes very clear from the Buddhist understanding is that, of course, as human beings, our bodies have its natural limits. And uh, the body will be, you know, physical existence can last only up to a point. But what we can do is, you know, according to the Buddhist understanding, is that the tranquility of the mind. Not, not no. necessarily Buddhist. No. I, I think the uh, common sense. No, common sense, no. From a common sense point of view, um, it is becoming increasingly clear that the tranquility of the mind has an important role in uh, maintaining a physical well-being and health. Then the question becomes how do we cultivate this inner tranquility, the calmness of mind, which is crucial for physical well-being and health. Then here, you know, of course in Buddhism, you will find specific methods that one can apply. We will also find similar spiritual resources in the Christian tradition and in other religious traditions as well. And even in the context of a secular culture, it is possible to find resources that will help us cultivate uh, the tranquility. Sometimes um, um, people get the impression, and in fact, there some people uh, act as if what you need is simply an uh, image of the medicine Buddha, because in, in the Buddhist tradition we have a, you know, embodiment of Buddha of medicine, and then if you worship this statue, then you will have a good health. Superstitions of that, are However, that approach is most probably nothing but superstition. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I think the important is real transformation within ourselves. Uh, just kept some statue, or as I mentioned earlier, you should recite some mantra. I think these are most cases, I think, superstition. Holiness. I have a, um, my name is Antoinette Zehnder and I have a rather basic question. Do you ever have doubts and if yes, how do you deal with them? The question is, do you ever have doubts and uh, how do you deal with them if you do? I think as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, even the spiritual practice field, you need doubt. Uh, I think, I think one example, the, the, uh, some kind of the doubt, where is I? Here, 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 where, 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 uh, uh, where is the set? And also, uh, we should have doubt. These appearances are truly reality, truly exist or not. These doubts, useful. And then the small, small things, whether I, uh, uh, whether I forgot or not, my pen here or not, some doubts. <laughs> and also, one important is uh, here, this suite. Whether, whether, whether in my so the small pocket, whether they street or not. All that kind of doubt. Always, always full of doubt. In daily life, full of doubt. So, so you, you need a bag to resolve the doubt. <laughs> yes. You need to check, check. Oh. I think what half I think joke. <laughs> <laughs>
This is partly as a joke, but it's related to the question of doubt. Um, uh, a close friend of His Holiness used, used to have these uh, lines, uh, which um, he would say in the morning, he would have a very um, full breakfast, and he would say, well, you know, we don't know where, you know, I don't know where I'm going to be during the day, so I might as well eat when I have it. So he would have a very hearty breakfast, and at lunchtime, again, he would say, well, lunch is the time, you know, uh, mid midday is the point when you really eat your lunch, so then he would eat a lot, and then at supper time, he would say, food is very good for your sleep, so he would eat a lot. <laughs> so is that what they doubt through? So we begin with doubt in the morning. <laughs> Ms. Holiness, my name is Jacqueline Zölig, and I have the following question. Are we as human beings, with all our emotions, wishes, behavior, and so on, only our brain, as is thought in modern neuroscience, or do you think that there's more to it? So the question is, uh, are emotions only to do with some, something that happens in the brain, or, or is there more to it? Um, in some sense, it is at this point, on this question, um, at least as science um, it stands today, uh, the Buddhism and neuroscience would depart. Uh, from the Buddhist point of view, um, um, consciousness and, and um, mental phenomena um, is understood to be more than the functional brain alone. Madam, you talk about this two years ago, but I don't when a neuroscience way, neuroscience to understand, you know, some of the same cells, page you have to check out. In fact, then it's some of the same you have to check out. For example, we find quite a lot of extensive investigation into the nature of uh, subjective experience in the Buddhist uh, philosophical and scientific text. Not all um, I think according, uh, Indian no, thought. according to classical Indian thought. Um, so, uh, for example, there is a very uh, detailed um, uh, distinctions made between certain categories and types of uh, mental phenomena, between conceptual thought and immediate sensory experiences, between veridical experience and more deluded experiences and so on. There's a lot of these kind of distinctions made. And, and these distinctions are experiences that we uh, undergo on a day to day basis. All of us uh, empirically we experience these. So, uh, so um, at this point, it is very difficult to see whether neuroscience will be able to account for these distinctions purely on the level of brain activity. And in fact, his audience was saying earlier that he, on several occasions, he has raised the question whether neuroscience can uh, envision an experiment where you can see a brain level difference between these cognitive differences. And some of Between the veridical experience and hallucinations and so on. So there may be questions also from the. Uh, uh, so this is a question about consciousness. Um, I showed some very, very simple robots and uh, nobody in his right mind would attribute anything like consciousness to these very simple robots. Now the fundamental question that I have from your view, um, is the emergence of consciousness tied to biological substrate or is it in principle possible that at some point it could emerge in artificial creatures like robots? Uh, 
Sebab yang satu malam. Jadi ini anda cek tak kunci bongsi atau bongsi mana? Kita kalau muncul sesuatu tu, kita mesti cek tak sesuatu yang mesti cek cek orang semua. Di kedai mana mesti cek? Nah, mesti cek ni lah. Jadi kedai yang mau buat mana? Mesti mana yang boleh cek tu? Yang tu sesuatu yang mesti cek. Jadi tu semai pembu. Semai pembu. Oh. Semai pembu sana dia. Dua jam tu. Pembu tu dah aku cek. Anda ha. ตาพาลูกชิบหนึ่งวะอ๋อเออเซมเซมเดมิสโตทูเรสเซมเดมิสโตทูเรสเซมเดมิสโตทูเรสเซมเดมิสโตทูเรสเซมเดมิสโตท
So generally, so generally, if we observe our own mental processes and emotions and thoughts, uh, the things that tend to really create a disturbance, you know, turbulence within us from a very depth tends to be um, very afflictive, like hostility, anger, and sense of um, 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 you know, strong craving and so on. But underlying all of this is a kind of a, a, a feeling of a sense of insecurity, some form of insecurity with relation to one's own identity and a form of a strong self-centered grasping. So whereas if you compare that... Deep inside, some kind of weakness. Yeah. So anxiety. So when some negative th things Events. come... Then, uh, we react uh, disproportionately. Uh, uh, in contrast, if you look at instances when we experience more positive emotions like love or compassion or affection and so on, which has the tendency love, yeah, to... Love through training, uh, um, not spontaneous kind. Uh, so then these kind of emotions and states of mind has the, uh, a sort of a quality of openness reaching out beyond oneself. And this arises from a kind of a depth of, uh, a basis of strength. There is a kind of a, a, a confidence, a self-confidence. Um, so by tranquility of mind that I'm speaking about, I'm talking about a state of mind where there is less turbulence caused by insecurity, uh, afflictions, and so on. So it's not a question of not having any thought, cognitive activity. I think obviously someone who I think who, who have a lot of experiences uh, and another less experience then between these two when some tragic things happen the person who have more experienced I think better position to, to, to face that those inexperienced then when some tragedies happen Oh, then more, more difficult to, ha to, to face it. Less resilient. So that the, the dua, tranquility dua. Okay. So this is what I mean by tranquility. There is a sense, greater resilience in the, in the part of those who have more experience. In your introductory remarks, you mentioned that uh, it would be very important to study in the first place the reality and to understand reality, reality in order to understand the human mind. So my question is, why is it important to uh, study reality in order to understand the human mind? Because my question is motivated by one important aspect which we have learned from cognitive neuroscience. We have learned that the human brain is constructing its own reality. So it's not reality what the human brain is constructing, it's a subjective construction, maybe perception or whatever else. So why should it be important to study reality in order to understand the human mind? Rather some there was some day, Dumidua, called Chima Lotko, called Lotte, the son, and she turned a Nemsko. 
Understanding of uh, reality uh, becomes crucial because uh, one of the things that we are in primarily interested in is knowledge and understanding. And how do you define knowledge as opposed to mere assumptions um, by uh, relating to the way things are, the state of affairs of the thing, and by sort of correlating our understanding with the way things are, then we can talk about uh, knowledge versus lack of it. So an exploration of the nature of reality is, an, is part of that uh, quest. <laughs> For example, purely on the level of um, um, the cognitive, you know, subjective experience, um, you know, people can have all sorts of ideas. You know, people can believe in all sorts of things, and people can have a thought of this and that. But how do we differentiate between what is a genuine form of knowledge and what is a mere belief? We are particularly interested in the influence of sleep and different sleep stages onto recovery processes in the brain, say in rehabilitation. And what is your view on the importance of sleep? I mean, for us, how much should we sleep? Or you, how much do you sleep? And do you agree? Um, in fact, there is a recognition um, in the classical Buddhist uh, knowledge of the importance of um, sleep as part of um, this, what it calls the sources of sustenance. And sleep is in fact listed as one of the key sources of sustenance of the human body. Um, so it's very crucial. And there are also uh, in, in the Vajrayana specific meditation practices uh, which are related, directly related to sleep. There's a discussion of sleep yoga and so on. Uh, for example, we distinguish between um, a, um, a dream state of the sleep and the dreamless, uh, deep sleep state. Nothing, nothing special, no. Nothing special. So, the, uh, uh, in my case, how, how many hours sleep? Oh, sleep is one of my most important practice of uh, meditation. <laughs> so, therefore, if the uh, uh, daily program and around uh, four, five. Uh, then usually, uh, sometimes I got uh, nine hours sleep. <laughs> sometimes seven hours, at least six hours. And do you dream? Oh yes, <laughs> of course. I, I, th I, I think at least my brain quite capable to create dreams. <laughs> 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 but of course, I cannot control my dream. Uh, some people, mm -hmm. I don't, again through training, some kind of control. Ms. Holmes was saying that there are some practitioners who might have been able so to. Science is just one, you Science is just one. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, His Holiness was rem remembering one of the discussions he had on dream between a scientist, and the phenomenon of lucid dreaming came up. Um, so there is a similar phenomenon in the Tibetan tradition, 
which suggests that individuals can, in some sense, have a kind of a more directed course of dreaming. But he's, he was saying that <laughs> he doesn't have that capability. <laughs> Now nothing, uh, nothing to say except I really appreciate all the speakers. So I think spoke uh, short, and very precise, very clear. So I appreciate, and also some of these questions from the audience also seems I think very serious, and you really show uh, the genuine interest. So I appreciate. So as I mentioned earlier, I think now this is time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>